so uh, so let's review quickly what we did in the last class so essentially uh, we looked at uh, we started with a simple example of germany you know try to understand what their uh, water budget looks like or what they claim on their uh, national web page and then uh, we looked at et load and you know how to compute one important uh, one important demand which is agricultural demand and what is it, what does it translate and then uh, we saw that well it's uh, not only spatial but it is also temporal that you know, it, you know at the start of kharif it is something then pending demand at the start of rabi and the, then for summer and then we computed what the uh, you know what this uh, so basically we saw that uh, there is this number so by the way i have corrected this uh, so the total rainfall is a star f where a is the total area and f is the rainfall and then each a uh, sub area so uh, you know ai is for a particular crop i which has uh, a demand ri uh, that's the et load then we have this summation ai ri which is the total volumetric demand for agriculture then we have to compare af with minus summation ai ri and see whether that is positive or not so then we evaluated uh, so we computed the rainfall rainfall was taken from the nearest station and then uh, total crop water requirement uh, divided by the uh, cropped area was computed and then uh, you know we com computed the millimeter of uh, uh, surplus and deficit so that told that tells us where is the water really coming from which villages are contributing water and which villages are net consumers of water and exactly uh, where does it come from <coughs> then we talked about uh, rainfall which is primarily the basic source of water and that the, we have two rainfalls and that uh, as far as rainfall is concerned we are uh, pretty good it's about average is about uh, 1000 between 800 uh, between a meter 800 to 1000 mm of uh, rainfall on the average uh, and then uh, comes the important question of runoff so we saw that uh, we defined a basin as uh, so there are 12 or 15 major rivers in india and each has its own basin uh, so if i look at the mouth of the river where it discharges and look at that point and look at you know that is the discharge point and look at all points uh, from which water goes to that particular discharge point so that is called the basin of that river so for example uh, the the yamuna ganga basin is of course the largest so it is this big and so most of the basins are in fact uh, most of our basins are uh, east flowing rivers Right, and there are very few west flowing rivers, and some important ones are, of course, the the Punjab, all the five, uh, Punjab basin, the Punjab rivers, Indus, which is a west flowing basin, and then Narmada, Tapi, are west flowing. Then all the uh, Konkan, you know, Western Ghat railway uh, rivers like uh, Savitri are west flowing. <coughs> then we also saw how, uh, you know, what is the raw data for a basin. So this is the Mahanadi basin. so we also saw what the picture of a basin looks like that there are there is a major river and then the, there are several major tributaries and just by the shape of the tributaries one can conclude something about the geography so for example here we see that and this is one tributary or main line and this is another tributary right and maybe this we can call as the third tributary and fourth tributary so between this it is clear that a point over here uh, the water has a choice of going on all three sides so it must be at a high place right and this must be a sort of a ridge line right a ridge line is a line which divides two valleys so it's a high line high uh, a ridge which is a you know as opposed to a valley which is a long you know which is a concavity a ridge is a convexity and it divides uh, two valleys so we will of course look at this in more detail in subsequent classes then we saw uh, <coughs> this is the data from the wris website which is also from the central water commission uh, so uh, so average water resource potential actually we computed that it came to 471 mm right the rainfall actually is 800 mm so it means that the other 330 mm is actually the infiltration so the net uh, average water resource potential is rainfall minus infiltration okay now utilizable surface water which was a question which i had now i remember what it means is that you see if i i say that a drop of water which is running which is flowing is utilizable if there is a concavity in the middle somewhere 
right? So if there is a concavity, then it has the potential of being stopped and stored. You know, for example, if I look at a you know slope which goes to the sea, then you may have that runoff, but it is going to just flow to the sea directly. <laughs> many many times, what happens, for example, Brahmaputra and so on, some to or for Punjab, many of the you know the runoff actually passes into some other country, correct? So the definition of utilizable has all of these other factors. Okay, so the utilizable part is fifty thousand MCM, and the total life storage is. 142 uh, uh, 14200 mcm so 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 this is how the infiltration and uh, infiltration runoff and all of these numbers are connected so obviously uh, you know if you, if you look at this so by the way from here to here there is rainfall and then there is infiltration correct so that infiltration of course in engineering it is in our hands how much we allow to infiltrate how much we decide to right is in our hands next from here, from here to here, right, is also in our hands. These are the amount of reservoirs that we wish to build, right, which we wish to trap the amount of water that we want to hold. Is this clear? So, note that, uh, you know, we may say that we want to hold 50,000 uh, MCM, but that is not a very reasonable, that is not very useful, simply because, you know, there is also, uh, it is like, you know, having a, if your annual sales is 50,000 uh, units does not mean you should have a warehouse of 50,000 units, correct, because there is a give and take uh, constantly going on, right. So, maybe at any time you may not need a warehouse of more than 10,000 units, right. So, uh, so we have to look at the seasonal flows the, and the demands which contribute to, uh, which you know, which tells us how much should our buffer be. Is this point clear, right. So, there is a, it is like you know, uh, exactly like a, an inventory inventory control problem that there is the annual turnover does not mean that the you know the size of the warehouse has to be of the same size right <coughs> of that annual turnover. <coughs> so, uh, the the second big rainfall was one major uh, one major flow the second major flow is of course recharge. So, <coughs> so here recharge by the way this is ground water recharge in meter cube per person ok. So, this is not in the, in the next slide I will show you what is the ground water recharge in terms of millimeters, right, but this is in terms of per person. So, then it is no surprise that uh, we do pretty badly, correct, and that is mainly because the denominator is very high. So, we have a big denominator 1.2 billion, right, and that, so that makes our recharge uh, about, you know, red, so less than 250 uh, cubic meters uh, per person. So, about 250, so remember that what we have available is about a thousand to thousand two hundred cubic meters per person of which 250 cubic meters is what is coming from what is being recharged and other uh, 750 cubic meters actually coming from the monsoon. So, no wonder we sing so many songs about the monsoon, right. I purva ye, I make mallar, so many rags are about the monsoon and very clear that the reason is of course, our great dependence on the monsoon. Right, so this is the recharge. So, so this is uh, basically there are two different geologies, or, or actually three different geologies which are operating in India. So, one is the large alluvial geologies, right here, over here. Right, then this is the Deccan Plateau geology, and these are you know clay, you know from here. For example, the Mohenjo-daro, you know the clays, deep clays uh, <coughs> geology in Gujarat and Kutch. Okay, so that is the these are three different uh, geologies are operating. So, by the way, uh, the north of this is alluvial and Himalayan is also basically schist, broken schist and they are very loose soil and very heavy infiltration. So, in fact, if you <coughs> if you have gone to the Himalayas, you will see that if you throw a pail of water, it disappears in no time, just goes in <coughs> straight. So, uh, and then these are the alluvial sands. Uh, so, if you look here, very high recharge greater than 300 millimeters per year. So, high recharge 100 to 300 alluvial. So, these are major groundwater basins. So, what is this complex hydrogeological structure, okay, complex hydrogeological. So, which which is basically Deccan Plateau which is us, okay. <coughs> and over here you see that on the coastal side is, uh, it is not even very high, it is just high, very high, uh, high recharge 100 to 300 mm and all other parts here is medium recharge which is basically 20 to 100 mm 
uh, per year. Okay, so now you know that a single crop needs 350 mm. So that tells you what is the ballpark. You know how much is the you know how much actually is being recharged. <laughs> so when we say that groundwater being depleted, you know, so and cropping area. So remember that you know you have to multiply this 100 mm by the cropping. You know the total area divided by the cropped area. So the total area is 100 and the cropped area is 60. 100 by 60 is that whatever 1.6, right? So 1.6 amount of recharge is available for the cropped area, correct? Because you will have 100 into whatever is the recharge equal to cropped area into 350 mm and so on, right? So this is the <coughs> equation, <coughs> right? So, uh, so as we saw in the last class that uh, groundwater is very basic not only as a stock but also that what is recharged in the monsoon is used in the, you know, in, in during Kharif is actually used in, in the in, in in Rabi. So, it is in fact groundwater is also a pipeline for transmitting water from one season to the other and from one geography to the other, right. So, it is an important constituent, not just some you know some stock, it is actually an important flow, right. It is a transmission in time and in space, right. So, it is very important for us, <coughs> okay. And in these kutch, the kutch area it is very high, medium. Uh, to very low recharge, so less than 100 mm per year. So, by the way, in in Kutch, the so if you here, if you dig, for example, in, if you dig in UP, you're going to get 100 meters of soil, soil or sandy schist, you know, uh, um, silts, correct, which hold a lot of water. Well, if you dig here, you're going to get maybe five meters of, you know, in in uh, in they can, I mean, in the Western Ghats, or five meters of soil. After that, it's like basalt or hard rock, and then with fractures in between, which have water. If you go to Marathwara, you may get about 40 feet of soil, and then some another 40, 50 feet of murum. After that, it's going to be hard rock. Correct. So really, the the amount of soil, you know, which is there in the Deccan Plateau is very little, right? About 40, 40, 50 feet in the in Marathwara, and even less than that in in the other parts of Maharashtra. <coughs> Any question? By the way, there are also thick soil areas. For example, in Belgao and Khanapur and all those other areas, the very, uh, very thick, very good soil. And in fact, it is Belgao vegetables which are, you know, exported from Belgao to all the other areas. Yeah, good. Any question? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so these are some groundwater estimates. From there are two important agencies: the Central Water Commission and the Central Groundwater Board. So these are two important agencies of the federal government, and there is recently a, a proposal by Mihir Shah, an ex-planning commission member, to do away with them and to form an apex body, you know, which will which will which will join both the Central Water Commission as a surface water body, and the CGWB is a groundwater body. So it says that uh, annual replenishable uh, groundwater resource, so which infiltrates, is 433, out of which only 398 is accessible. And out of which 245 is already being accessed, so our utilization is 63 or 64 percent, 63, 62 <clears> percent. <throat> anyway, so uh, that brings us to a uh, close to uh, the first part of the hydrologic cycle and the basic flows, right? So, any question? Yeah. Yeah. Where? Where? L last year. Uh, oh, by the way, so this is taken from a. Uh, this is taken from so world. So you see, there are these grey tones, right? You see this. So it also tells you the relief. The relief is the elevation. Okay. So actually, there is an online site, um, you, the ymap.org. So you can actually ask it what it you want to show. Okay. So I have clicked on world relief. It means that. It should also show the elevation at that point, okay, roughly. So you, you see here, for example, that it shows this crinkly black and white gray tone, right? Which is that like these are highlands, right? And you'll also see some crinkly things here, which is the Western Ghats and so on. Okay. So let's go to the next part. Yeah. So now what we are going to do is, you know, start now that we understand the balance 
right and the big stocks right and the broad estimates of what is really going on. We will now get into actual measurements of uh, and estimations of these quantities right. So, the job is actually when you go out to the field or you are in charge of a region say a district or a watershed or whatever you should be able to compute the water balance for that particular area on your own right and once you compute the water balance you should be able to recommend what needs to be done what engineering uh, devices or social devices or economic devices need to be constructed or need to be uh, uh, evolved okay so uh, we must how much how where quantify and so on so how do you measure rain where does it go and so on so of course we know that you know uh, precipitation to runoff is a complicated story and there are various factors which uh, influence so interception that is when a drop falls it touches something first that is called the interception so it may touch a leaf or it may touch dry soil wet soil you know plant you know grass or whatever and then it flows if it touches a plant it is called stem flow along the stem it flows down right and then it infiltrates conversion of the liquid water to soil moisture so here is a change of phase so from a liquid it has become moisture which is not really a liquid <laughs> right and then it saturates the soil there which means that all the pores in that soil gets filled and then after that there is runoff right so if you see what happens from a drop it goes you know it touches some maybe a leaf or a stem or a reed of grass it flows along that reed of grass enters into the soil becomes moisture you know finds empty pores you know settles down in that empty pores right and once those empty pores pores get filled then you know so it's like a you know cup or like a cup of sand you know you can keep pouring water into that cup of sand eventually you know all the pores are going to get filled and then the the cup of sand will start overflowing right so what has happened that the cup of sand has become saturated right so what does saturation mean that all the yeah all the voids in that you know in that soil structure have become full is that clear okay so this is what happens when right and then once you you know what happens to the infiltration part so there is of course uh, post excess flow and then there is base flow which again reaches the stream right and by the way i have drawn something like this called the water table so i want to introduce you know something called the water table that is the depth you know or that is the depth if you go down in many alluvial or many of uh, many in the deccan plateau you know there is a point if you dig you know water will start oozing out of the soil spontaneously right that point that depth of that of that point is called the water table at that point is this clear so so under the water table we will see what you know we will you know understand what is this uh, you know how the mechanics of it later but there is a point so if you have been to the beach you know that if you are close to the beach and you dig you know at some point the sea water is going to start coming in right so the water table is fairly shallow over there if you dig one or two feet you are going to hit the water table <clears throat> so one way of looking at the water table is you know you look around the wells in our area right and compute what is the depth you know compute your elevation and compute how many feet have you gone down right so you will see that that is the water table above mean sea level so for us in in uh, iit the water table is determined largely by which two quantities yeah pavai lake and vihar lake so really our campus is between two lakes and the the level of the lake pavai and level of the lake we are so we are slightly higher and this pavai so if you you know all our you know the water table is really being uh, is in is in that is sloping in that way so by the way have you seen any wells here open dug wells no bore wells hand pump jara dekho theek hai find out where they are no some ug your ug students no no piche ha huh? pd Oh, okay, okay. So, so you have been here for one year. So you know where the bore wells are, huh? Where? And pump there. Well, by the way, the Jimkhana grounds are, you know, are, are watered using uh, bore wells at the four corners. 
So, in, in fact, next to is just opposite H8, if you see that new, new structure which has come up to the left of that structure is a pump house, right. And in fact, the bore wells for the uh, for all the Ijimkhana ground is essentially coming from there. Another big open well is if you look at the hospital, near the hospital there is a open dug well and you can peer down that and see how deep the water is. <coughs> so, by the way, I mean if you are, <coughs> so I think it is a good idea now whenever you go out on a field visit, if you spot well just peer down and see what, what you see and it is you know you will see the strata, you will see you know what are the rock features, you know how is it lined, is it unlined, is it dry, how deep is the water table, who are the users, right. All of these are important things about just like you know a botanist would look at you know, a new plant or an old plant and see you know its flowers, seeds and so on. For us in the water sector, a well is a you know is something is a curious is a is something which is worth studying for us, right. <coughs> so, what happens you know how deep is it, when does it dry, who all use it, you know. So, these are all important parameters, <coughs> okay. So, by the way, so, so let us just look at what happens when it rains. So, typically what we will do is you know calculation of runoff or measurement or observation of runoff is typically done at a point, right. So, maybe we are you know these are the streams which join and at it is at this point that I am computing the runoff, correct. So, note that, so what does that you know stream, the, the amount of the water flowing, if stream t is the amount of water flowing at that point, what is it? It is only surface, so it has never entered the ground or it entered the ground sometime, right. So, if I look at a molecule of water, it may have entered the ground, you know infiltrated, then flowed in the ground, then come out somewhere and then you know in followed the stream, maybe gone in again and so on, correct. So, a molecule which is which has fallen over there the tra or rather which is coming out at time t, instant t may have you know may have entered the system you know 10 days ago or may have entered the system half an hour ago, right. So, there is a wide variety of, uh, uh, of you know the delays between a water to have entered the system and to exit, right. So, uh, so, if I look at you know I can write precipitation t equal to infiltration. So, these are all just those conservation equations, correct and you will see that you know the precipitation equal to output. I mean if I just write down the trajectory and classify points by trajectory, you will come across the same conservation of mass equation. So, the only point I want to stress is that if a point, if a water molecule is infiltrated here, here then it is going to take a long time to move in the soil and then come to the stream and then rapidly come down. While over here right this you know this trajectory of that particle in, in soil may be quite small and then it comes out over here right. Is this clear? So, really a simple estimation of when does a molecule come out right is if I know the velocity of water uh, in the stream and velocity of water in the ground then it just say given a molecule just find out the nearest stream you know multiply that distance by the velocity in ground and then look at the stream to the out multiply that by the velocity on 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 uh, in the stream and you will get an estimate of um, or divide by that, not multiply divide you will get an estimate of how much time has elapsed is that clear correct. So, this is very important this sort of estimation is very important in understanding floods you know for example that if water is you know in Gangapur Dharan if the if water is released or if there is so much rainfall at this in this area you know what will be the level of water in in Nasik in Ramkunda in Nasik and uh, what high how high will it go right. So, all of these are questions how much delay will be there how high what is the exact stream flow all of these are important questions and they are basically amenable to mathematical models, okay. You can actually write down simple models and the basis of that model is exactly this that there is some distance to be travelled in soil and some distance to be travelled in in in, uh, in the stream. So, I should know stream velocities, I should know uh, ground ground water velocity and then I can compute the <coughs> rest, okay. So, as a result what really happens is that after a rainfall event right. So, there is some amount of water which is overland correct which has never entered the ground 
but a lot of water actually enters the ground and comes out very slowly right so so it has it right the the thing which runs off directly is governed by only the you know the surface water flow velocity while one which has entered the ground is governed by uh, stream or velocity or you know surface water velocity and therefore you will observe these things right so you will observe that the overland water so if this is rainfall you know at that point overland water starts after some point correct and then peaks at somewhat later after the rain and then drops down while the base flow water which has traveled through the ground you know comes out much later and then you know goes out you know goes slowly right is it clear so after the rainfall you know about 4 or 5 days 3 or 4 days after the rainfall all which has all the water that you see in a river has actually entered the soil somewhere so it actually a ground water flow so it has entered the ground and is coming out at some point okay yeah so these are uh, so these are actually our own our own work so this is trying to estimate the runoff from you know so as i said that in the in the in the for a particular village the amount of water which is actually available right is very important right if the rainfall is 600 mm but 250 mm runoff right then the net water available for agriculture is only you know uh, 350 mm so it is very important that we have a model for computing the runoff right so you can advise the village that well your runoff is so much and maybe you should do something else correct <coughs> so these are so the same village right so uh, so we have built models to estimate how the runoff will be so these are actually two years of 2016 a good year and so on the left is so these are daily rainfalls okay the blue lines are daily rainfalls and they are in mm on the left and on the right are the total runoff cumulative total runoff right by the model predicted by the model right and so this is again in mm fine so uh, if you see here so there is initial spell of monsoon then there is a dry spell then two days of very heavy rainfall you know not heavy one inch one inch and then you know uh, then this is good and there is a long dry spell of 69 to 85 that is 16 days right no rain for 16 days and actually it goes so there is some rain uh, then from 65 to 105 so 40 days of really very little rain yeah Ah, pratidin. So these are pratidin. So this was actually this talk was given to agricultural, you know, whatever scientists from Maharashtra. So pratidin parjanya matlab every day rainfall, right? And Pedgao Parmani 2016. Then Pedgao Parmani, Pedgao and Parmani Taluka Parmani Desh 2050. Okay, right? So on the x-axis, uh, ekun apadhao apadhao is runoff. Ekun matlab total. cumulative runoff okay cumulative runoff is uh, so much <coughs> okay cumulative is total total runoff so i, I have just integrated the uh, you know the daily runoffs okay <coughs> so in my mathematical model you know i have the daily runoff so what i have done is i have tried to you know i have done the accumulation of that runoff to tell him uh, tell the uh, village that your total runoff is 275 mm and that year how much was the rainfall 2000 i think it was 750 was it ha 750 mm was the rainfall so out of which 250 mm was the runoff okay so 500 mm of water is available for the village is that clear <laughs> so what it brings out the runoff what this particular graph brings out is that there is a massive dry spell right so in this dry spell of 40 days right 65 to 105 is 40 days you know assuming 3 or 4 mm of requirement 120 mm of requirement was there so all those farmers with some good and of course there was some some little bit of rain here so 10 20 you know maybe 40 50 rain so 120 was 40 a deficit of 70 mm 60 to 70 mm was the deficit what is the deficit et load was 120 but the available rainfall was only 
So, 50 mm of deficit that crop must have faced. Is that clear? So, the quality of the output or the yields are going to suffer. So, really in that case, right, whether the soil was thick and murmured or quality of soil, how much can it hold? Remember, we said that soil moisture can hold between 20 and 50 mm. So, good soil is like a bank, right. So, if, you, if the soil is good, it will hold 20 to 50 mm and then, you know, that particular farmer would have, you know, would not have taken a beating in this, in the dry spell. <coughs> is that clear? So, really the, the water budget, you know, the water balance temporally week to week also matters in terms of uh, agricultural output. <coughs> so, by the way, if you look at this second graph, this was a really bad year. So, the total rainfall in Parmani was only 250 mm, correct. So, everyone suffered, right, and uh, and then the total runoff was 60 mm, right. So, 60 upon 250 is 1 by 4 and 250 upon 750 is 1 by 3. So, higher the rainfall, the more is the runoff fraction, right, and that is quite obvious because, you know, it is like your cup of sand, if you, you know, if you keep you know, the cup of sand is a limited soil capacity. So, if there is a lot of rain, then there is going to be a larger fraction of, run of runoff. <laughs> How can they control the runoff? How can they? Correct, correct. So, but the runoff, you see it is, uh, you see the control the runoff. So, we will look at how to control the runoff. But what I am saying is that exactly, these are the questions that an engineer must ask. So, now it is very clear that the village must have, you know, as I said development, what does development mean? You know, avoidance of uncertainty, right. Now, here is uncertainty in your face, right. You, here you see, you know, 40 days of only 70 mm water, right. That was unexpected. So, what does development mean? You know, assured certainty, right. So, how do you produce from this variable rainfall a steady state rainfall. So, ideal thing for the farmer would be 5 mm of rainfall every day, you know steady state like buses come on time, rain comes on time and is you know limited, right? that would be their ideal situation, right. So, the development problem is really how to reduce the variance of you know the mean can be acceptable, but the variance has to come down, right and that tells us what are the design issues, how should engineering design proceed to reduce variance, right. Like for example, you know potholes increase variance, right. So, really a lot of engineering is about reduction of variance, right and that is a very major task for development. <coughs> so, we will, we will come to exactly how to do, you know how to fix this, right. So, it is clear that this should be done at the farm level. Right. So, this water if there is bad, so there are many things. For example, if you if you see farmer, you know if there is, uh, you may have read in Marathi where uh, matlab, to desilt existing streams. Now, when you desilt, that is very good soil. So, all the farmers with poor quality soil or thin soil take this soil and put it on their farms, right. So, <laughs> desilting of soil, desilting of old rivers and streams. So, where does that soil go? A lot of it about 30, 40 percent can actually go back to the farm, right. So, that you have a, you know half a meter, uh, half a meter ye soil. <coughs> so, by the way, the number we are losing soil at the rate of 2 mm per year. Farmers are, so if 10 years, you know if you 10, 15 years, 30 mm, you know, couple of inches of soil has been lost. That is on the average. <coughs> yeah, so, uh, so we now understand so, what we saw there was immediate runoff, right. So, runoff that is the moment the drop hits the, so, hits the soil, there is runoff, right. So, some of it enters, some of it just runs off, right. So, what we saw those plots were immediate runoff. Now, of course, some part enters the soil, you know, moves a bit and then comes out. So, immediate runoff and base flow, right, is this is base flow which has actually gone into the soil. <coughs> so, that comes out much more steadily. Right? Why? Because it is traveling long distances in the soil and then coming out, correct, at various geographies. <coughs> so, typically our model for, for this is an exponential decay model and <coughs> this 
alpha is the half life right so if you look at you know how many days does it take for a for a stream to half its flow so if it is flowing at some 10 lps or 100 lps in how many days will it lps is liters per second in 100 lps is liters in how many days does it flow 50 lps correct right so in koken for example the half life is roughly 20 days in 20 days so if you go in october oh, lot of water you know 20 days in november you know it has half in december it has one fourth and by january february it is dry right all people from koken know it is this is exactly the story that the half life of of streams in koken is 20 to 30 days right and what would be like would we like to increase or decrease the half life huh? increase the half life right we would like to make it two months correct so we would say that well i don't want the initial high flows right because after all if i integrate the total flow it must be equal to the total water which has come in right so i would say that don't give me high flows in october give me low flows but give me steady flows correct because if there are steady flows then i have the chance of doing rabi cultivation so and if you look look at gokand hardly 10% of the land has rabi cultivation because the half life is 20 feet 20 20 days so by january all the water is gone <coughs> correct right so these numbers a e raised to my plus b can actually be estimated right given the runoff data or given the base flow stream flow data you know so so i am saying that the runoff you know the stream flow is runoff plus base flow so runoff is which has come immediately right base flow which has entered the ground and traveled some time right so in this picture right so in this picture what did we see this is the overland runoff correct and this is the base flow right so actually to measure base flow you should start you know looking at it from here so about 10 15 days after the rains have stopped right at that point you will start seeing the base flow is that clear before that it is mainly runoff you know which is here yeah, so basically water which is moving on on the ground for some time as a sheet of water you know through the thin thin soil oozing and seeping and then entering the stream yeah any questions here yeah these are the intensities L, uh, the rate okay lps liters per second or liter whatever you need to integrate so if you integrate it you get the total volume right yeah good health uh, <laughs> good health matlab good health or good our uh, good expectation so we would like so al how to reduce alpha that's a big question how do i reduce alpha and that the jury is still out how do you exactly reduce alpha so it seems to from earlier work by mtech students and many other there is a big group in atri in bangalore uh, atri it's ashoka foundation which is working on so there are many people looking how do you actually reduce alpha <laughs> so does afforestation reduce alpha does soil thickness increasing soil you know you know how what is the mechanism because if you look at afforestation what it does is it increases the et load right so in fact stream flows will reduce but you know maybe october time stream flow reduce but they are more steady is it clear not clear okay so we have seen essentially we now sort of have a better idea of how uh, how the you know infiltration and stream flows actually uh, actually so we want to estimate stream and we have seen some models so really the model that we saw for estimating uh, uh, estimating runoff was called a curve number model you know it's a it's a mathematical model it's called curve number so there are many models to estimate you know so that curve number depends on you know that particular piece of land thickness of soil then land use and so on and by that there is some mathematical formula by which we can compute ki so much fraction of the water will run off right so there are many models for computing runoff so some of them depend on slope so for example in this this is a watershed in chitradurga but we also compute these maps so this is you know this is a map by slope right so slope between 0 and 
you know, 1 percent, 1 percent to 5 percent, 5 and above 5, right. So, classification of that particular area by slope will also tell you how much of the water is going to, will also help you predict how much of the water is going to go off. So, there are uh, standard models for water states which we will see, <laughs> okay. Uh, and then basically the flow model is essentially a iterator. So, you know you have a, you have a state, this is so much moisture available on this day, this is the amount of water which has come in, then you know, you understand it is a, it is a kya bolte, time sequence, right. So, it has a state rainfall plus current moisture minus this equal to next day's moisture, right. So, and then this is the runoff. So, there are some. So, these are some coefficients for example, alpha and beta, alpha and beta. So, here alpha is the infiltration, beta is the subsurface flow coefficient and then these coefficients are estimated by you know by various means and then this is how the model actually works, <coughs> okay. It is a computer model. So, it is a computer model with 3 or 4 coefficients, right, which depend on that particular location, right. Based on that location, we can actually estimate what the runoff uh, what the total infiltration and uh, other attributes will look like, <coughs> okay. So, any questions? So, we understand now uh, at the end of this 20 minutes, we understand the basis of that what happens when it rains, okay. We began with what happens when it rains. Now, we understand that these are the, you know, things which happen and these are the models, you know, by which one can actually, you know, predict but there are one also needs to measure. So, here are the measuring instruments. So, on the left is the simplest, it, on the left is the, uh, is uh, the, what is it called? The rain gauge, right. So, by the way, so let me uh, remind you that in the rain gauge, so there is this upper, this is the upper A, you know, upper way, uh, A and then there is a nozzle, the funnel and a nozzle, right. And then in the nozzle, it goes to a lower cylinder which is calibrated, okay. So, you see that, so what does it measure? What is, when I say 5 millimeter rain, what does it mean, right? So, if I put a pan, right, then I will, it will fill up to 5 millimeter, right. So, ideally what would you do? You know, so it is exactly that they have put up, put out a pan which is like this, correct, this, this is a pan, right. And, and then, uh, and then this is the calibration uh, cylinder. So, by the way, the diameter of the calibration cylinder is much smaller than the diameter of the pan cylinder. Why is that? Why would you have that? Turbulence. So, have you seen, have you read the paper? It say, it used to say, nowadays they have stopped 35.5 mm. It rained 1.9 mm in Santa Cruz or whatever. How do they get that 0.9? Now, if you actually measure, if you put it in a pan and measure the level, you can hardly make out whether it is plus or minus 1 mm. Forget 0.5 or 0.2 mm, right. But on the other hand, you know, if I reduce the diameter of the calibration cylinder, then 1 mm of rain is going to produce maybe 10 or 15 mm of water in the smaller cylinder. Is that clear? So, it is really a mechanical amplifier, right. So, the least count of the instrument becomes actually 0.2 mm instead of 1 mm. Huh? Capillary in a normal a volume, you know, A1 into A1, if A1 is the area of the top cylinder, A2 is the area of the bottom cylinder, A1 into 1 mm is A2 into what? Volume will be the same, okay. So, it is not capillary, it is like a mechanical amplifier, right. So, much water in this area will become, you know, <laughs> much larger, much higher water in a smaller area, right. So, it is to make the instrument more sensitive, okay. It is to make the instrument more sensitive that we have this, we have this. So, by the way, if you go to uh, many dam sites and so on, you will again see that, you know, if you want to measure the height of, uh, of the water column, right, instead of having a vertical scale, they will have a tilted scale, right. Why would you have a tilted scale? Because, you know, one centimeter height may move the water a lot more, right. The slope is 1 is to 10, then when the water level rises by 1 centimeter, it actually rises by 10 centimeter horizontally, right. 
correct and many places if you go to many beaches what is a good beach that 1 meter of change in tide actually changes the water you know between the high tide and the low tide maybe half a kilometer correct for example if you go to have you been to bordi and golbert that area in bordi if you see 1 meter it the the distance between the high tide and the low tide is 1 kilometer so the slope is actually 1 in or 2 in 1000 so it's a very gradual slope right so these are these are the uh, so this is really an amplifier so this allows you to read you know at much greater accuracy <coughs> so by the so this is a tumbler uh, of course you are not going to be here to watch all so you see this 11 mm 12 mm 13 mm all these readings are here so this is an automatic rain gauge so here there is a nozzle and under that nozzle is a tumbler okay so this is a tumbler <coughs> right so so it's like a tap right and a tumbler like this so once this compartment gets full this becomes heavy and it topples over and so every toppling produces a pulse is that clear so there is an you know <coughs> so there is this nozzle which is created bucket so tipping bucket so the funnel and this from here water flows right so water is flowing steadily so every time so this water flows through here and flows into this tumbler so once this tumbler gets full what happens the tumbler you know topples and the new tumbler comes in and this water can be thrown this water need not be collected because what has happened once the tumbler has turned a pulse is generated 0 0.2 mm is that clear okay so so it just keeps tumbling back and forth <laughs> okay so the bucket moving bucket right keeps tumbling so by the way i mean all of you are physics student so try and design this tumbler right it must be designed you know so it is symmetric of course right and what should the shape be what should it you know for example you know what should this a be for it to tumble is it clear that if this fills up right that it will tumble correct so how does it it is not very easy to see that it will tumble right <laughs> or it needs some amount of design you know by the what is it called the balance of what what are those force diagrams called they are called force diagrams huh? free body diagram so you have to have con construct these free body diagram to so there was a very interesting puzzle that there is a during the old je days you know or entrance exam days that there is a ball which is full of water right and there is a and it is there is a small hole in it and it dripping one by one you know the it is losing drop after drop it is losing water right so that ball is becoming empty so plot its center of gravity height of the center of gravity or distance from the center so what will happen it will be at the center then it will drop down then again go to the center right because it will become empty again it will be back in the center so something like this is really happening here so when the water starts filling right in this tumbler at some point the torque you know to the left is more than the right you know because the weight of this tumbler and so on so it is very interesting so you should just do it as an exercise I think maybe I will ask it in a quiz or whatever yeah so the second thing once i have this rain gauge now the next job is for me to estimate the you know at any every other point what is it so you can't have rain gauges everywhere correct you can't have rain so the next task so I, what i'm trying to do is show how measurements are done and how estimates are actually prepared right so our job is to you know as an engineer scientist is to convert you know make you know so we saw some models now we are going to see how to extrapolate data right so we have rain gauges at various location right now what would you like so if you have a location so you have a rain gauge at location p1 p2 pk and you have some location q you know you have to you know estimate you know you have to estimate the rainfall at q given the rainfall at p1 p2 pk so how would you do it simplest way of doing it But nearby, what is the simplest? The simplest is from Q 
find out the nearest rain gauge right and attribute that value to this q okay the simplest is to take the given this q find out the nearest rain gauge and whatever is the rain there attributed here okay this is the simplest one so in a line for example let me so in a line okay say you are if you are in a linear world you know it has rained so much over here you know it has rained so much here and rained so much here okay and rained so much here right okay now what does this say that if i am here right or if i am here you know what is my attribution so my attribution to here will be this is the closest point so i draw a line here and this is my rainfall correct so over here i go over here and say this is my rainfall correct we we can take the average right nothing is exactly at the center right is it a taluka place it, if it is taluka it is never at the center okay it is always off center fine so what do we have i can have the midpoint here midpoint here midpoint here and then i can draw these lines right and i say well up to here you know up to here it is this then from here to here it is this then from here to here it is this and then from here to here it is right correct so from this data i have constructed this as my approximate data correct is that clear so i have extrapolated the data that i had with you know so i have constructed a function from a point data so i had data available only at a point a few points and out of that i have constructed a function of course you will say here this is a silly function because a much better function would have actually been like a linear interpolation correct you would have said that at least in the linear case a much better solution is found by linear interpolation but the thing is that for 2d just try it it is not easy okay so exercise for today is to think how would you do 2d interpolation right 1d interpolation is good that the constructed function one good advantage is that the construction is continuous while our you know nearest point approximation is not continuous as you said what happens in the middle you could either go left or you could go right but if i did a linear interpolation function it would be continuous is that clear not clear or clear not clear anyone okay so what i'm saying is that the linear interpolation function this one is continuous okay and this one this one not continuous so anyway we will talk about this tomorrow in the next class